Our next guest has been featured in Vogue, but that's barely scratching the surface. Liam Maskell is a law graduate, renowned mental health and disability advocate, and four-time best-selling author. Her debut book at 25, The Model Manifesto, shook the modelling industry to its core, sparking government action against exploitation. But when Leanne was diagnosed with ADHD, she shifted her focus to disability awareness. And I think it's fair to say she knows how to make an impact. She launched countless petitions, spoke at the World Health Organization, trained industry giants like Google and Disney, and wrote two books on ADHD. Now through her company, ADHD Works, Leanne empowers ADHDers to navigate the workplace and overcome the barriers to success. I mean, how can you compete with that? Let's get into it. Let's see how great minds think differently. I'm just going to start by reading a LinkedIn post that you posted this morning, Leanne. Welcome to my ADHD morning. Set three different alarms for 6 a.m., despite this being one hour earlier than needed. Procrastinated getting up for 30 minutes. Managed to drag myself in the shower. Sat on the bed procrastinating for 10 minutes. Dried hair in a different room for no particular reason. Tried to curl my hair and set up a LinkedIn Live at the same time. This is apparently impossible. With 15 minutes to go, try on all outfits and freak out. Send photos of all these outfits to Sarah H, who messaged, are something completely different. Pick one and realize I'm actually not supposed to wear black. Try them all on again whilst attempting to do makeup in two minutes. Freak out over what belongings to bring. Inexplicably bringing hair straighteners, another top and three books. Run to the station, get on a tube before checking where I have to go. Arrive early and go into Oliver Bonus. Trying on a whole new outfit in the shop on top of my clothes. Impulsively buy outfit and two pairs of earrings. Change into new outfit in the bathroom and decide I hate it. Refund it and realize I am not where I need to be picked up and I am now late. All whilst beating myself up for being so irrational, chaotic and stupid. These are the hidden parts of ADHD. The daily stress with seemingly easy tasks and trying to come up with inventive strategies that actually make everything much harder. Does this resonate with you? I think you're amazing. And I think you're amazing for posting that. Why did you decide to post that this morning? The more I've written on there about like my reality of my life, the more people have resonated so much with that. And they say it helps. Actually, this resonates so much with so many people with ADHD, and particularly people that would come on like podcasts like this, who kind of from the outside might look like they have huge achievements, but then it's like, that's not the struggles that they have. It's the getting dressed or showering or changing your bed sheets or eating food. Like, you know, literally these things are the things that will be really, really hard for me and, and so many other people. And then, but society is like, but those are the easy things. I, I feel like I have like a responsibility to show that in the work that I do. So, And how does it feel hearing me play back your words to you? Kind of funny because I realised I wasn't wearing any of the earrings I bought. And But also, yeah, it's, that shows the financial impulsivity that comes with ADHD and how these things all relate to, together because when we're stressed, we're not really thinking things through. I think in the writing about it, it kind of helps me to process these experiences myself and make sense of them. It also presumably kind of records them right for you yeah yeah but i'm 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 interested in in how in how much you beat yourself up about that yeah i think it's again i think it's like the constant narrative and i think again it's an ironic thing with adhd because i think we work so so hard to i guess meet like neurotypical standards of what you can see on the outside so for me personally like my whole life has been very much like from the outside everything looking fine and then internally just chaos and and I think for me personally that's something that has come from a very young age because I started modeling when I was 13 so I was like in vogue at the age of 13 but literally at the same time I was being bullied for being ugly so it's like Wow. These two contrasts of the world where like the society holds you up on a pedestal for one side of things, but the reality is very, very different. And I don't feel like a model or pretty or, or any of these things. The best society is like, yes, that, there you go. You should feel grateful or you should, people should feel um, aspiring to be like you. But I guess I feel quite bad like that people would be like, oh, I, I want to be like you or I want, I want, I want to, whether that's in a modeling sense or 
now with what we do with like ADHD and the books, etc. Because I try to do a lot of like, this success won't make you happy. It's not the same thing. Learning about you, you know, leading up, leading up to today, I was really struck by your sense of justice. Just he- help me understand a bit more about that, your sense of moral justice and where ADHD fits within that for you. I think the main thing I see with people with ADHD, and I guess myself in getting this diagnosis, is their realisation that it's not your fault. And I think, you know, the statistic that says by the age of 12, children with ADHD receive 20,000 more negative messages than their peers from adults than children without ADHD. It's very hard not to feel like, oh, it's my fault Mm -hmm. in some way. And I think that's definitely how I grew up and definitely with the modeling, et cetera, and feeling like, oh, it's, you know, my fault. When I was 13, I was in a women's wear campaign and um, had like a lot of experiences that were really not not right. But then being like, oh, it's my fault because everyone else thinks that's normal. And then I think the older you get, the more you're like, actually, maybe that's not like a normal thing to go through. And then finding out that I had ADHD meant like, oh, okay, so maybe these things aren't my fault. Maybe it's not my fault that I feel like I can't fit into society and um and even on the one side but also that the basic things are so hard because it gives you a reason and an understanding I I think having ADHD as well makes me very like angry at the way the world is structured because like I got A's in my exams I got a law degree but it's only because I realized how to hack the system I guess like I knew that I could do exams I knew that I couldn't do coursework so I just picked exam subjects and you I studied everything off Wikipedia I memorized it all like a week before but my teacher asked the class if I cheated because she was like it's not possible that Leanne has got all A's and the same with the law degree and then I graduated with no idea how to use this law degree no idea how I'd even got it um and then I think seeing actually like it's not fair because so many people like yesterday I worked with someone that they failed these cognitive tasks these like tasks that job interviews often have and she was really upset about that and really worried about like getting a job in the future and I was like well who set those tasks like who's decided that that's the right way to think and you know so many people grow up I think and because they haven't got an A in maths they believe they're stupid we all have these internal narratives which and telling us so many of it, you know, well, I guess whether you're idiots, you're not like being like we're not good enough in some way mm. when actually maybe it's the system and the structures that are broken rather than like you as an individual. And I, I guess that underpins a lot of what I try to do in trying to change that and make it better at least for people that come next because I think that would have really changed my life in knowing that from the start. And so why did you create the petition? Can you just explain what the petition was that you created? It was calling for the government to do a review into um, the support before and after ADHD diagnoses. And I made it because last year there was a parliamentary debate on ADHD and autism assessment waiting times. And at the time, so before that I worked in law, I worked in mental health and disability and immigration legal policy for a couple of years. And because I'd worked with the government and I knew how like politics worked and the change is a very long process. I wrote a book about modeling when I was 25 and everyone said to me like that when I was writing, they're like, do you have a publisher? You know, no one's going to care. Everyone is jealous of models. Like, you know, very much like you have no idea what you're doing and so much judgment. But then that book ended up on the cover of the times and the government set up like a working group to tackle exploitation in the creative industries so i kind of could see from that experience like i wasn't a famous like kate Moss yeah and you, model. and you can make you can make something happen yeah i basically just went on it like i kind of burned on my bridges and i was like i don't care and i would message like super high up people that i would never dream of talking to and i was like i'm writing a book about the exploitation of models do you want to help me and all so many of them replied and I was like oh actually like if you it's because we think that people won't help us or we think that we don't have any power or who am I to do this so that things don't happen it's ironic because the only reason I got to that point is because I basically became really really suicidal and I thought um you know the same it's an ironic thing to beat myself up there but I I would like constantly beat myself up and be like it's so selfish to um, take your own life. And I you know, I could go and volunteer in like Africa, but I couldn't decide where to go and volunteer, where to submit myself. So then I thought, okay, I could just write this book and then die. So I kind of had like 
so that was what kind of allowed me to do all of this stuff because I just thought well, I have nothing to lose I don't care if like they say no it's like and I don't think people should have to get to that point to to realize that yep. actually you can make a difference and it is worth trying and your life can change and so what then you created the petition you had over eleven thousand uh signatures but the same thing, I would never really have thought to write to my MP if I didn't have that knowledge already. Mm -hmm. I basically made like a template letter for people to send to their MPs to say, can you go to this debate? And so that petition had, the, the debate had so many um, MPs there, which was amazing. And they were like, I've been inundated by letters. And the government committed to collecting a national da database of information about ADHD assessment, because that's the problem, because they don't have any centralized resources on this. They don't actually collect any information about the waiting times in the centralized Everything's way. Everything's farmed out, right? Everything's an individual NHS trust. It's all really, really not very transparent. Um, and that's what allows the system to continue in the way it is because they're like, well, you know, it's not our fault. But they did say in this debate like that they would collect that information. Shockingly, nothing happened. And so that's why a few months later I decided to make this petition because I was like, it's only from doing this over and over again that things will happen. And then the ADHD medication shortages happened, which kind of reignited my own passion. And I think 11,000 people signed it, which means that the government have to respond. And unsurprisingly, their response was not our problem. Pretty <laughs> vanilla, like, wasn't it? It was like, actually, the NICE guidelines say that, you know, um, people with ADHD should receive a, like a holistic healthcare treatment. And there's no actual requirements on how long the waiting list should be. So we don't have to do anything. And so therefore, it's okay if it's 10 years. Yeah. And that really underpins like so much of the work I do and like creating um, like the company have like ADHD works and training ADHD coaches and writing books about ADHD and doing all of this stuff. They were never going to reply to that and be like, you are right, we are going to make an inquiry. But the more noise that you can make an awareness about the fact there's a problem, people can do something about it. And even raising awareness about the support that's available in within that process, like for example, Access to Work is a UK government grant that can pay for people, anyone with any health condition, to access up to £66,000 worth of support per year, per person, to help them with their health condition that affects them at work. So it could be anxiety, um, long COVID, chronic fatigue, but for ADHD, even if you don't have the diagnosis. Okay, I was going to ask, do you yeah. have to have the diagnosis? No, and that's why I said the pre-support and the post-support, because... Like in the meantime, you know, when I've been to my own GP, they've been asking me questions about ADHD and what kind of support is that that they can tell people. And I'm like, wow. why do you not know this? Um, but if the government kind of, I think if someone took a step back and looked at all of the support available for like neurodiversity in general, because um, I also went to the World Health Organization, I think a year and a half ago, and presented to the directors that on exactly this, because I was like, these issues are not going to go away. They're going to get worse and worse. And there'll be more and more people desperate for support but actually that diagnosis isn't necessarily the answer like I think people think like okay once I finally get the diagnosis then I would get support but actually the reality is for many people then they go on another waiting list for like a year to even get medication and as we see now like the medication is not even available so yes. and you can't correct me if I'm wrong Leanne you cannot uh you cannot get medication for ADHD unless you have a diagnosis yeah but from what you're saying, access to work, let's say that phrase lots of times, access to work, you don't need a diagnosis for. No. Uh, and that's available now. Yeah. And that can pay for, you know, I've coached many people, uh, myself as an ADHD coach, who don't have the formal diagnosis, but being able to coach them, help them like start their businesses and like develop the strategies to work, like work, because as literally the point of, you know, your podcast here, like we have such amazing talents and it's just harnessing them and understanding them and how to use them. Like this, we say a lot, like pills don't give skills. Like you know, the medication can help to an extent, but it doesn't actually help you know how to use your brain. Like no one gives you a book and says like, here is your brain. This is what it means for you. This is what you should do next. Why is there a medication shortage? Well, I think that there's a number of reasons. A lot of different factors, including the patent for the ADHD medication is up this year. of Alvance, the one I take, they... There's been said that it's like demand, um, like global demand. But I'm sure that there's a lot of different pharmaceutical reasons that we don't really know or understand. But I think it's a completely ridiculous situation to be in because 
the ADHD medication is a controlled drug. So yesterday I called my doctor because I've been to like two pharmacies a day for the last two weeks trying to get my own medication. And every time I go in, they're like, no, go away. So I finally thought, okay, I need to call my doctor to get the medication changed. And they said, if just so you know, if you ever want to change medication, it will take you seven years um, on our waiting list. And I just could not believe it. And I was like, I would be dead if I had to wait seven years to access and because they were like, basically, that's the waiting list for the assessment to see the psychiatrist. Yep. And I said, what about if I go privately? Will you accept that like private change? And I said, yeah, after eight months. Basically, when I was diagnosed privately, I then was told I had to pay. I had to pay a thousand pounds. And then I was told I had to pay 300 pounds a month to get this medication. And I was like, for how long? And he was mm. like, forever. And I was like, how is anyone meant to go through that? That is completely insane I got really really unwell on the medication because I was taking it like some gold dust I wasn't taking it as prescribed um and then I demanded a letter for the NHS but that psychiatrist was really against it they were like you know you're gonna have to go through the whole process again it will take years and I was like well I, I don't have a choice I was like I, can't, I literally didn't have a job then my life got so much worse I need it which is actually yeah it's something I'm really passionate about sharing like you know you think great the ADHD diagnosis is wonderful but actually like a lot of people go through a crash afterwards because they don't know what they're meant to do with that information. They go on medication that literally changes the way they think. They might tell their employer, they might, you know, so much, and they might go down these vortexes of ADHD and everyone in their life is like, can you just shut up about ADHD? But there's no real support there. Yeah. Um, so I just literally went straight back to my office job and started writing a book about ADHD mm. <laughs> because I was like, well, it's not just the medication. There's so much information that people should know. Like, you know, there's so many things that you can do to help yourself. But if you are on that seven-year waiting list, what are all of these people meant to do in the meantime? And that was five or six years ago. So imagine what it's like now. It's yeah. just, it, I think education is power. And and if you don't know what your rights are, it's impossible to use them. But so many people are now understanding their rights. Like when I wrote that book, ADHD, I to say, the first time someone told me about right to choose, which is that you can actually ask your GP to refer you to a different um, psychiatry company. Like there was, there was one called Psychiatry UK, for example. So they were operating online. So actually maybe you wouldn't have had to wait seven years but you could be referred but even the doctors didn't really know about the access to work like yeah and I think that the root of that is social media because essentially it's allowed all of this education to share so I think social media empowers a lot of change and I think that's very uncomfortable for a lot of people and if I take you to the flip side like um of that I think it also empowers a lot of hate <laughs> and uh and misinformation exploitation and again these are all things that I'm so passionate about for, for me personally, like um, when I, so the fur book I wrote was basically about social media and body image and mental health because for me growing up, I would compare myself to images of myself in magazines. Like I was forced to lose loads of weight. At castings for modeling, I would often be asked like, you know, how many Instagram followers do you have? And like agencies would be like, just buy, follow it. Like it's all completely fake. It's mm. not a real world. Um, and now I see these kids that are growing up in that world where their parents don't understand that actually like TikTok is literally brainwashing them into their insecurities. It's not the content because like if you were really insecure about, I don't know, your knees, TikTok might know that and show you images about your knees. But you wouldn't, someone else looking at that wouldn't know that that's what was making you insecure. But it's really insidious and really bad. But that's what drives, you know, I receive a lot of it personally now. It's very, it kind of amuses me because... um, You receive a lot of what personally? Uh, kind of people that backlash. will... Backlash, yeah. Like I saw a comment yesterday, it was like, basically saying I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing because of my age, because I'm young and I don't have any experience, I don't have any qualifications and... um. Oh, and that, that they, you know, writing crappy books. So that's, and that person that wrote that, it was quite funny for me to see because I know that they messaged me being like, can you come and work for me for free? I, I really love all the things. And then on the flip side, like writing stuff on the, but the reason they do this stuff is because it gets them attention and it's so bizarre to be in the, okay. so I just block them. Like, yeah. you know, because I've lived in a world, you know, when I published the modeling book, a really, really famous model agent, she come and, who actually helped me with the book, but she wrote a comment a review, a one-star review saying this is victim tripe. And, um, and yeah, you know, obviously I freaked out. And then I realized if she can be bothered to go out of her way mm -hmm. and leave a one-star review with her real name, it literally 
that's the whole point of the book. Yeah, you're sharing the truth, right? And and some people don't like that. Yeah, and nothing like that exists in the modeling industry. And that is what keeps the modeling industry so exploitative because you don't know that until you get in it, for example, agents can lit the contracts, give model agencies the ability to get you into debt and sign you into contracts without your knowledge, but you keep your legal responsibility for those decisions. So they take your power of attorney. You know, I literally had agents do this to me. They got me a thousand pounds in debt in a week. And I said, you have to pay. And then they're like, and you're being charged 10% interest on this. And I just... You know, and you don't know that until you actually get into these contracts, and it's the most exploitative, bizarre world to be a part of. And it's, com it's, and that I guess goes to that sense of justice because I hate the fact that, like, you know, I studied law, and when I was studying law, I saw this happen in, in the industry, and I was like, well, wow. why like, did you study law? Um, I had a really great law teacher. Okay, that was really, really nice to me. So I think that that kind of impassioned me because she was the first person that didn't make me feel like stupid. And also, I just I really wanted to learn about if what was happening to me was right. Because, for example, I, as a literal child, I had people get me naked and like you know act like it was my fault when I got upset at that and say like you know we're gay like and act offended. So I grew up thinking like oh it's my fault for like feeling feeling bad about this or being put on like the cover of magazines and like bikinis when I was like 14 years old so mm. I think I kind of wanted to understand for myself like is that was was that stuff meant to happen or like I have three daughters Leanne and, and I'm you know they're 11 and and under and yeah just it like boils my blood right hearing this kind of stuff um and I think it's so powerful that you ended up becoming a lawyer i think that says so much about your experiences and and why you know when we think about what i read out this morning right you're kind of like okay what does this person do you're not going to probably guess lawyer right <laughs> you you the the stereotypical lawyer is is not ADHD. The stereotypical lawyer wears a suit and is is all put together and all, you know, diligent and buttoned up. I think it's it's incredibly powerful that you had those experiences growing up and that's led you on this on this path and thread of of kind of justice and fight and and voice and agency to kind of make change, both for yourself but also for other people so yeah I, I i think that's i think it's incredibly admirable thank you it was only after i was diagnosed with ADHD that i applied for this job at the law society so i ended up getting getting this job where i was like a, pol a legal policy advisor but and so i went and worked with like the home office and was like the government and went and and i worked on the um coronavirus like emergency legislation and wow. was like it was it was <laughs> it was very intense i was like i don't yeah. know what i'm doing oh my god but it, it was no amazing. one knew what they were doing yeah though. so it was an amazing, it's amazing you've experience. been at the front line of like kind of really like sort of leading the charge and flying the flag you know whether it's modeling and exploitation or whether it's disability law or it's COVID and response and management to that. And now with ADHD, because I'm very good at spotting patterns, I can like, I can like add you up really, really, uh, yeah, with these kind of seemingly really different things like modeling and law and ADHD um, and being an author. Let's talk about being a business owner. And running a business, when did you set up ADHD Works? About a year and a half ago. For me, it was an interesting journey. And as you said there, I think there's not Steve Jobs quote that says you can only connect the dots looking backwards. But I have actually been self-employed since the age of 13. And all of those modeling experiences, they actually make me such a great business owner now, I think. Because, for example, in modeling, you can't get paid for at least um, three months minimum. So now, like, you know, when I work in general, I try to basically say all of the money has to be paid up front. And it's amazing to work with companies and see, like, actually it's possible. Yeah, like, forma, just well. like your banjos. Like, so talking to people who run businesses really helped me understand what steps to do first and how to do it. For me personally, I just wanted to help people. And, and it's interesting, again, with those dots, because working in the, like, official world of law and policy and change... That's where I could see, and it was so frustrating to see that 
you know, we would write these huge, a good example is the Mental Health Act. Um, you know, we spent so much time and energy and so many amazing people. And I think the government did this. They've been reviewing the Mental Health Act for like seven years. And then last summer they were like, yeah, I'm not going to do it anymore. Lol. It. And that is just the most astounding thing. And, and that's what I found so frustrating about working in that world. And for me, having come from the modeling world where like I did that book and then it was on the cover of the Times, I was on the rain, like all of these things happened. I could see that actually the way to make changes, like, yeah, that stuff is very important, but the way to make changes to do all of the things at the same time, like all of the things that people don't do, that's how th how change happens. And that's the same thing. I wanted to see the impact of the work um, like on the side of that law job I was writing ADHD notice ad and also uh, uh, like we would do these government responses and there was one about body image and I was like I'm just going to do it on the side and like got models together and designers and wrote about diversity and inclusion in the modeling industry so I was kind of doing lots of things anyway and I thought like this will really help be able to help people on an individual basis and and so ADHD Works is a business that trains coaches we do and, a lot yeah and also <laughs> coaches people who are not necessarily diagnosed ADHD so how it kind of started was like I coach people myself was very quickly inundated made courses to try and help people learn how to make a course um again because like the mechanics of running a business like you only have so much time yep in so a week. make it scalable you know, you know I burnt out very quickly mm -hmm. um and then I was like, okay, how can I help the most people? Because I could take on a certain number of people as clients. I was like, if I make a course and do group coaching, it can help help them. And by the end of it, I had like 65 people signed up to the first ADHD course. And then I made the rejection sensitive dysphoria course. And then we ran an ADHD retreat with my friend, which was like an amazing experience. So I made this executive functioning framework and linked it to like worksheets that I use in the coaching to help people essentially understand what ADHD is for them, how it's showing up in their life, what to do with it. So go for like self-awareness, impulsivity, memory, emotional regulation, the rejection, sensitive dysphoria, so that we're giving people skills and strategies. And actually the reason I set that course up initially was because I kind, even although we had the broader courses, um, people still wanted one-to-one -one support. Also the fact people that come to ADHD coaching, they don't know what they want need they don't know what they need help with they just know they need help they're like i just want to understand adhd what does this even mean yeah they're not coming to you going hey look i've got this goal and i want to make this happen in, in a year's time can you help me with the steps to get there yeah, exactly and because so much of the adhd coaching is just validation and understanding having someone that understands you and that you can be yourself with who can tell you about things like rejection sensitive dysphoria and you you have the light bulb switch and you're like, oh my God, now I now I can understand this. Let's just talk about rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Yeah, it's um so it's linked to that emotional regulation and executive functioning. But it is a the experience of extreme emotional pain that is triggered by real or potential rejection. And it's said to last for a limited period of time. Um and it's said to be the one condition that is solely related to ADHD in comparison to conditions like bipolar, borderline personality disorder. It was coined by someone called Dr. William Dodson. So it's not something that your doctor is going to diagnose you with. Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite ironic because I've done a lot of work on this. And that's what led me to go to the WHO. Um, because someone said about the ADHD book, they said, uh, there's a whole chapter on rejection. And they said, you know, RSD is not like a clinically recognized thing. It's not real. Like they were quite a like high up person in the ADHD world. And I said, well, just because it's not recognized in the outdated diagnostic criteria. And I was like, that's actually why so many women and girls in particular are going misdiagnosed or diagnosed with other conditions or like told they're just being emotional, hormonal, mm -hmm. your, your period. But actually that I think I'm really strongly believe that this emotional criteria should be in the diagnostic criteria because that's what is also leading you know people with ADHD have got a five times higher risk of suicide one in four women with ADHD has attempted suicide and when you think about that extreme emotional pain combined with impulsivity like that makes obviously total sense. makes sense yeah and that's why it's really important that it should be taken really seriously and understood and and that people can have what we call it like name it to tame it so when you understand what that is 
then you can put strategies in place to manage it and look after yourself and take responsibility because I think that's the key thing. We're not being like, everyone, you no, know, no. never reject me, poor yeah, me. Like, yeah, it's not an excuse, right? It's not a, hey, I can't take any critique or I can't take, don't give me any feedback, please. No, I, I think it's an important, empowering piece of people being accountable and taking responsibility and owning their shit. But if they don't know... Well, that's what essay of ADHD can explain things, but it doesn't excuse things. It's an explanation. It's not an excuse. Like, and that's what is funny because we are in this world, particularly of the media, where yeah, it's like every day you see a celebrity being diagnosed with ADHD, and everyone the comments being like, "Oh, it's just an excuse for them to act." Have you know, literally those counselors saying in the Warwickshire Council, um, I think they said like, basically, is it is it ADHD or just an excuse for bad behaviour by children? Yeah, bad parenting, just naughty behaviour, all that kind of stuff is still out there, right? All those all those yeah. stereotypes are definitely still present. What's your hope for? society and ADHD. I'm not talking goals. I'm just talking hopes. <laughs> I hope that our society will come to a place, and I think it will have to, where people are more accepted for who they are, regardless of their struggles. And I think it would be great if we had a society where people were kind of celebrated for their strengths and complimented. So like, for example, running the business, some people in the team, like, you know, we had a girl who said, oh, I don't want to do emails. And I was like, cool, you're actually really, really good at, like, what do you like doing? And I was like, and what are you good at doing? You really love doing all this. She was amazing. She was, her brain is completely different to mine, but she does all of her backend, like, technological things. And I was like, cool, and I'll find someone that does like it. Because she said, oh, but no one likes doing emails. And I was like, no, there are people out there that, like, Sarah, there you mentioned, she does her emails. Like, love writing emails. Yeah, I, like, I love doing emails. So, like, it would be great if society was run like that because, you know, all of the people that we have in our company, they love it so much because they get to do what they enjoy. They're valued and they're happy and they're using their strengths. And the bits that they don't like or they don't feel good at, there are other people that can do that. I feel like ADHD is a broader kind of signifier of that because there are things that we might be able to do really well. Uh, like, you know, no one can come to my house and get me dressed for me in the morning, but like a world where we didn't feel like that you know the fact that you read that poster or the fact i even posted that where that's not so like shocking i really hope you don't need to write anything like that regardless of whether it's happening in your life i really hope that's not a post in five ten years i just hope that you you don't need to we don't need to be sharing we don't need to be so publicly vulnerable to share a message that kind of says hey guys uh here's the reality like, here are some of the struggles. Yeah, you see the all the nice bits, but actually, here's also what goes on. And just because I've got all the nice bits doesn't mean I, I don't have any of these challenges. And I kind of hope that we get to, yeah, we get to a place where it's like, so what? You yeah. Know? Yeah, my hope for myself is that I don't have to write any more books. <laughs> Personally, on the personal, it would be great to have a rest. <laughs> Speaking of books... Have you brought something for our neurospicy cabinet? I bought you the self-published version of ADHD and A to Z. So this is a copy before the publisher bought, bought it, basically, and I edited it, and it's just the first version that I did all by myself. I guess in the same way of that post, it's like people are not just... They don't, they're not like, oh, um, I went to a school last week and did a talk and this woman said, oh, but you know, she was like, you're a success story. And I was like, I'm not a success story. And I was like, until a few years ago, I literally had no, I almost died. And I was like, if it hadn't been for a random select bit of circumstances, I wouldn't be here. And if I died at 25, like, yeah, you know, yes, I had a law degree and I did modeling, but like, I was so, so unhappy. And so it's funny now to do, do things like this or to do talks, et cetera, and people will announce like all of the achievements you've done, but actually they come from making mistakes, figuring it out, being vulnerable, chasing your ideas, I think is the key key thing because yeah, so and look, you, don't. you take action, right? You know, someone told me you only you only build self esteem through esteemable acts and mm. you can't think your way you can't think your way out of this kind of stuff, right? And you can't think yourself content or satisfied or fulfilled. So action's really important and you absolutely embody that grit and resilience and persistence of speaking up, standing up and taking action. So it's been an absolute delight chatting to you and hearing more about that, Leanne. Thank and you. 
keep up doing it, please. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for having me. Thank you.